So I'm just going to introduce our next speaker. So Mokeda Makeka is a principal in Dalberg Advisors. He is a South African raised in Seru, Lesotho, and New York, United States of America. He is an accomplished architect, artist, creative, curator, global leader, scholar, speaker, and urbanist. He holds a Bachelor of Architecture degree, magna cum laude from the University of Cape Town, and various executive leadership qualifications from, the, from Harvard Kennedy School in Oxford University and others. McKenna is a board member of both the South African Green Building Council and Cape Town Central City Improvement District. He was a young global leader at the World Economic Forum 2015 and is a member of the WCS Young Leaders in Urbanism. He is an Aspen Fellow in Leadership 2020 and is also one of the 40 cultural leaders of WEF World Economic Forum 17 Davos, alongside such luminaries as Shakira and Forrest Whitaker, who were recognized for speaking truth to power and seeking to change the world for better. He is committed to social transformation and cities, especially concerned about the positive role that stage, rail stations can play in economic justice. Again, if you have hands, virtual hands or physical hands, please with a warm round of applause, welcome our second speaker, Mukena Makeka. To, there we go. Um, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, uh, for, for the introduction. I also want to thank the previous speaker for a really thrilling presentation that gave a lot of insight into Morocco, which I wasn't aware of. So looking forward to engaging with you offline about that. And thank you to all of the 40 participants who are here with us today. I'll quickly go into the presentation and share with you some thoughts and some reflections on this important topic. Is my, my screen in hand? Can everybody see that? Fantastic. Perfect. Okay. So I, I was really intrigued by, by the, uh, the proposition of the question as set up for today's discussion. Um, and the challenge that I had in mind was, you know, do I talk about the work of my own practice or do I talk about the work of other architects who have grappled with this question of justice and, and architecture and so on. And, and, and I just want to be clear, I think there are many examples out there that have done it uh, far much more justice to the question than I have. But having said that, I thought it was useful to, to maybe invest some time in sharing some of my reflections in terms of this journey, um, bearing in mind that there are probably other actors out there who have done far much better. Um, you'll see there, uh, this is the emblem of my, of my practice and has been for years. Um, inspired really by the, the, the Russian phrase, uh, le voie escustivo, which means uh, a leftist art. Um, it is, it's a phrase that came out of the Russian constructivist movement of the early 20th century. And you might ask, why would I find affinity with that particular time period or even that phrase? What was remarkable, uh, I think as a student of architecture was for me to look at how different societies have taken on the challenge of reinventing themselves around this question of justice. Um, now, bearing in mind that the, uh, we, we, you know, the, the whole Soviet experiment, uh, we can talk for days about the successes or failures of that, but I was really interested in about that period between 1917 and pretty much up until 1922, when there was an attempt to, to construct a new society, an attempt to reimagine an architecture, an attempt to reimagine a, a more just way of accessing architecture, which up until that time had been the preserve of the elite. And I found great parallels with that sort of inclination with uh, my own experience studying architecture, uh, literally from 1995, the year after our uh, freedom. So we in my generation were particularly seized by this question of what does an architectural justice look like, given um, the history of apartheid, but writ large, the broader history of colonialism and how architecture was often a proxy for the representation of alternative realities at the expense of local voices. So this is where this sort of idea uh, began to re almost remind me of an attitude that I wanted to bring into my work and to also to claim the right that, that architecture is art, I do believe. Uh, it is technical, but I do believe it has an artistic dimension, which is far much larger than its technocratic uh, constraints. But that brings me to the question of today's discussion. On, on, the, on my left-hand side, uh, there's Femida, 
uh, a sort of Africanized version of Lady Justice. And then on the right hand side, there's uh, William Blake's um, seminal uh, painting, uh, Ancient of Days. And the reason I juxtapose these two things together is that I think it goes to the heart of, I think, the challenge of the, of the architectural act. Um, Femida was uh, a concept uh, imagined by uh, Emperor Augustus as a sort of lesser deity, uh, really, really established to speak about this question of justice, justice that was impartial, justice that was, was blind, hence her looking away from the scales of justice. However, um, if you check the history, in fact, uh, up until the 16th century, uh, Lady Justice had sight. Uh, Lady Justice uh, used, um, uh, you know, her, her ability to perceive uh, the environment around her as a sort of data point that, that, that influenced the bias of decision making. So the notion of blind justice is actually only about 400 years old. Juxtapose that against uh, uh, William Blake's drawing of, you know, Ancient of Days. Uh, this is the, it's a play on the archetypal architect, the, the hand that is actually measuring uh, the environment, the eye that's looking downward, it has a supreme sense of control. And between these two conditions, one can see the, the dilemma of the architectural act. The fact that as designers, we do have agency and the ability to command and draw and put things into perspective, um, and that we are also highly oculocentric. But at the same time, we do want a world where architecture can be more just, uh, where it can be more fair. But I would argue that um, in order to be just, one cannot be blind. Uh, one has to see the environment that is there. One has to make judgment. One has to intervene. One has to bring positive prejudice or positive bias uh, into the act of designing in order for architecture to be effective. So in many ways, um, justice cannot be blind. Justice has to be ethical. Now, I have three or four projects that I'll take you through where I want to maybe demonstrate this sort of tension between what one sees, what one does, what I saw, and what I thought was important for the particular project. Uh, I was engaged to do um, a refurbishment of Cape Town train station. Uh, this was for the World Cup in 2010. So this is uh, one of my earlier projects from my career, uh, commissioned uh, roughly around uh, 2007. So we had about two and a half years to get up there. And seeing was a big part of the narrative. So the, the one question was, what would the world see of an African World Cup? How would, it, how would it perform? And there was this huge burden on South Africa to not only represent the ambitions of a, of a competent um, continent, but also a competent uh, Black agency, for lack of a better phrase. So the question of what one would see when one came to a continent where in many parts of the, 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 the global north, the perception that the architecture of worth and of value coming from Africa um, is not particularly well known. So this question of what do we see, what do we show, and how do we perceive ourselves was a big part of the, of the architectural question. But it also wasn't just about the, the visual nature of the project. It had to do with seeing our culture, seeing how far we've moved beyond apartheid, seeing our different complexities, and how do we use those challenges in a thoughtful and, and constructed way. On the right hand side, there's an image of uh, uh, Cecil John Rhodes, a play on the roads of, of Colossus, um, a very ambitious colonialist with his ideas of connecting Cape to Cairo with a, a railway line, um, eventually managed to even have whole countries named after him. But the significance between these two points is that Cape Town Station actually represented the, the tipping point or the beginning point of that particular railway journey, that infrastructure narrative, this notion of, of empire connected by, by architecture and infrastructure. This is an image of the, of the facility uh, close to just about uh, three or four months before the World Cup started. I'll give you a bit of an explanation of why this panorama is, is interesting. What you're seeing in front there is a, is a forecourt. Um, suffice to say that uh, this intervention was very much an insertion of adding and taking away and really tweaking um, an, a, a, an apartheid edifice. It wasn't about a new build. Um, and it also wasn't a tribute to my own visual sense of what I think a train station should be like, but it was much more a compromise and a reflection of the complexities of South Africa, its limited capital, its contentious past, and its struggles uh, with sorts of decision-making. Having said that, um, I thought that this uh, plan diagram of what the railway station looks like would be quite interesting. You will probably notice, and I'll just see if I can uh, 
use use uh if i can annotate slightly uh one moment okay this one doesn't allow me to annotate but it's fine but um you'll see that it's actually a terminal station and what's significant about it is that the one terminal was actually designed to access and service um, areas of the city which were preliminary for white people and then the the tracks were successively graded according to race and towards the top of the page where you see those larger sections which is where the goods are those would be the tracks that were uh, closest to where people from the townships and uh, uh, the black and brown parts of the city came from so the the even the the sense of arrival in the station was was racially constructed and with the notion that black people are located next to goods and uh, table mountain which is the, the scenic backdrop of the city which is towards the bottom of the page is where people of, of, of white descent would be privileged in given the sight of the mountain. So in this very, very subtle, what looks like a practical diagram, you're actually seeing a, a political statement of, of inequality. And the forecourt that you're seeing uh, more towards your left on that side becomes the meeting place or the condition between which the, the, the people disembarking from the railway lines engage with the city. So that public forecourt becomes a very important pivotal and mixing point and which is why I took the, the language of the railway tracks and decided to morph it into a sort of um, uh, landscape diagram to kind of break down the linearity of what the uh, of what was the original conception of these of these railway lines. Here's some just some quick images of the sort of signage that um, that was up on the stations um, as recently as uh, uh, 1989. Might not seem that recent to some, but it's definitely within the living memory of many people. And here's another image that begins to also show the absurdity of the enterprise. So in many ways, this diagram is a perfect encapsulation of South Africa, so or, or the old South Africa. On the one hand, a desire to racially segregate to the use of infrastructure, but this diagram also shows that there just wasn't enough money to have a single staircase only for white people or black people. So eventually black and white people did have to come together. And in some ways, this staircase is, is a metaphor for the folly of, of some of these drivers of, of unjust thinking and how reality brings people uh, back together. I think it's a very fascinating image when you read it as a sort of taxonomy of, of, of the racial discourse of South Africa. This is what the, the, the forecourt looked like when I uh, was approached to do some work on it. I've, I've said this before in a number of presentations, but it was super curious. You weren't allowed to walk on the grass. Uh, so, so it wasn't even a real public space. Um, it was, uh, although it seems visually manicured, it was really a place that was um, uh, a sort of blight and a place of ill health. Um, we did a, a, some studies and found that 64% uh, of the crime within the central city either emanated or had a direct relationship to the to Cape Town station. So we're really talking about a piece of infrastructure that had undergone a fairly significant decline um, uh, in terms of its urban reality. And what we proposed was a different type of plaza, a different sort of square where it was about meeting, it was about engagement, but it was about a new sort of public life um, in contrast to what the, the station represented before. It's important to also remember that in, uh, I think in 1964, when the station was opened up, the then president uh, Vervoud actually celebrated and said, this is a shining example of apartheid um, because the, the, the architectural logic of the building was the perfect expression of, of architecture and race uh, um, working in, in disharmony. Uh, in, well, I would call it disharmony, he would probably call it harmony. So, so this was quite a politically charged project of a public space in which all of these different communities could come together. Um, through various um, so-called value engineering, some of the elements that I'd imagined were not in place, but we did manage to create a new sort of platform, a new sort of public realm. And uh, when the event actually came down to South Africa, we had one of the most successful, what was called fan miles taken from Berlin um, in 2006. And this was the notion of the city um, really connecting two nodal points and, and, and the city becoming uh, essentially the theater and a part of the performance. So where the city was historically divided, now we had the station and the stadium acting in, in tension and then reimagining the whole street about uh, three and a half uh, kilometers long so it could become this new and vibrant place. And the image on the bottom right hand corner shows you that square on one of the nights uh, when people come, come, came to celebrate uh, New Year's Eve. And 
for me, one of the, the most fascinating things is that with this project, it wasn't about the creation of a new building for, for an architecture of justice to emerge. It was about creating a negative space that gave people the opportunity to find community and to find gathering um, as opposed to what was there before. So in, in this exercise, there was an, an interesting sort of critique of roads, as I said before, a critique of the sort of what is the visual language of what did we want the station to look like? I wasn't obsessed on the visuals of the station itself. I was more interested about the visuals of people interacting different races, different backgrounds, different income groups uh, coming together in, in quite uh, productive sorts of ways. I just want to check my time here, see where I'm at. I'm at 13 minutes. Okay, just some quick renders of the interior space. Um, uh, you might see traces of some ideas of you know, Philip Johnson's uh, work. Um, it's it, an intriguing building in its own right. And the question of how to, to know what to retain and what to remove was quite important. I decided to open up vistas towards the, the city. So uh, what might seem fairly ordinary, which is to have clear glazing before that was blocked off and it was very much an insular building with a limited number of entrances um, and really much designed with a sort of military mind state. So it was how you could shut it off, prevent um, uh, you know, uh, terrorism and how could you control the flow of people. And this design is very much about unlocking the flow of people. So in some respects, it, in my own mind, it was an attempt at democratizing space, even though that notion is probably somewhat highly contentious in, in the architectural realm. And here just some images of people from around the world coming in. I think this was a team from Uruguay, if I remember correctly, moving through a building which for years and years, you would not historically associate with different cultures, different backgrounds, joy, uh, levity, or, or even happiness. That work then translated into another body of work, which was to reimagine what could happen to the city if that train, that railway station, which is above ground as I've shown, would be sunken underground um, and how much, what would that mean for the city? Now, the broader question of, of Cape Town's uh, history has been um, apartheid, very, very expressed. So very much about using railway lines and other forms of infrastructure to keep um, uh, most uh, people of color out or to only bring them in for, for, for labor, so a sort of dormitory relationship with townships. And what we proposed was quite a radical opportunity that could unlock, in our estimations, roughly 30,000, these are just diagrams showing corridor development that quickly go through, uh, roughly an additional 30,000 uh, live, work, play opportunities. Uh, and then because of the adjacent land parcels, it would be released on either side, which were currently sterilized by the railway line. We demonstrated that an additional 100,000 people could come and live in the city. And this was quite a deliberate statement about how does one use railway infrastructure, which historically was used to separate people and say that if you unlock real estate, you can allow for housing that is close to railway transport so that you can actually make it more affordable to live within the city and remove us from a sort of car dependency um, cycle. But even beyond that, uh, and I won't dwell on it too much, but there was also a much, much big, bigger um, urban planning piece around how do we think about uh, these railway lines. I mentioned before it was a terminal station at the metro level, but also it separated, uh, it's, it's a combination of a separation of various communities across the whole city. So we had some radical discussions about how do we use um, uh, a revised sort of transport uh, nodal uh, condition to allow for better north-south connectivity, better economic growth, and, um, with, you know, it would spur opportunities for better economic growth and allow for uh, better social integration. And um, yeah, just some quick images. I mean, I particularly like this one because the <laughs> what I did here is all of those green spaces are actually uh, sites of military locations from the colonial era. Um, and I inverted the diagram. So I used all of those, what would have been uh, positive spaces, in other words, in buildings, and made them into negative spaces and then surrounded it with housing. So that, that begins to define these queer configurations, but it also meant that those public places, we would be able to excavate the ground and be able to show the foundations of fortresses um, and other sorts of military infrastructure. And then the public space gets into a constant public dialogue uh, with people about, about history and conflict and, and reconciliation. And this was just, a, I'll just quickly go back there. This was a, a quick render that we did to show a new uh, museum of transport that I had proposed. Uh, transport is a big sub-narrative of equity and lack of access uh, in the South African context. So it's not just about movement, but it's about mobility, goods, ideas, services, labor, practices, and capital. 
And this is just another shot showing the, the sort of one of the, the urban iterations of how the housing could work. I'll quickly go through the next two projects, be just being conscious, I think I have only three minutes left. Um, this is an image from Kailicha, a township on the outskirts of the city. Um, it's, a, it's a township that suffers from periodic disasters, whether it's flooding or in this case, fire. Um, a, a whole host of makeshift dwellings with limited land tenure, um, shacks that are too close to each other, all of the sort of uh, dynamics of any sort of um, uh, informal settlement. The opportunity that came uh, uh, to me was to design a community center in this context. And there were a number of things that I decided to do in, in relation to this question of justice. The one was to really critique the amount of capital that the city had set aside essentially for this community, because uh, it certainly felt as if it was a lip service project um, and that the least amount of capital would be deployed in order to keep the people happy. So I made various petitions about the importance of, of noble public architecture in these communities as a form of social justice, uh, managed to get the, the attention on this project um, increased, not only in terms of budget, but also focus, but also community engagement. And uh, what was quite remarkable about the project was that it, it was able to catalyze um, a, a vision for a, a neighborhood development around there. And um, very, 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 very successful in a number of respects. Now, I mentioned the issue of fire before and flooding. What I did particularly with this building was to perhaps overly proportion the, the columns and the main elements uh, so that they appeared more robust and, and muscular and, and permanent. If one thinks of the sort of uh, Michelangelo sort of, um, of, of columns, so the, the, the structure is hyper exaggerated and that hyper exaggeration has to do with, I was acutely aware that I didn't want the architecture to represent fragility, to represent temporality, to give a sense that this building could burn down or flood. So it was about you know, robust offshore concrete, uh, big columns, big pillars to subconsciously communicate um, a sense of investment, uh, a sense of permanence. And here, there, there, was, there was the politics of proportion was very much uh, my, my thinking uh, in the project uh, itself. And then you can see the front facade on, on that portion, which opens up to a public square, which at this time had still not been landscaped. And the idea was also about a building that gave back to the community. So it didn't turn its back to the public square, the street, but the whole facade becomes an open engagement with society. And that's another form of um, spatial, uh, an attempt at spatial equity, um, if you will. I, I'm very averse to, to projects that shut themselves off from community engagement. Um, and there's some interior shots of it. That's a shot of it at night. And here you can see it. But again, what's fascinating about these images, you, you can just see the, the conundrum of, uh, of inequality, right? So this was a project which when I was building it, there was no funding for roads at the time, which is really curious. I had to fight tooth and nail to get 20 trees put in because of the way that um, the, the budgeting works. So th this notion of even development which might happen elsewhere in the world, it's very, very difficult to achieve in many parts of our cities. Uh, and you often have to do what I call uh, anticipatory architecture. That is a, an act which, which suggests and gives clues for how others need to latch onto it because there just isn't enough capital to present a complete and coherent vision. So it's very much about an architecture of clues, an architecture of hints, and an architecture of, of, of possibility. My last project, uh, and I'll, I'll go through this fairly quickly, very, very specific challenge dealing with the railway police. I, I suppose, probably like many people on this phone, uh, we probably come from societies in which our trust of the police is somewhat limited, uh, whether it's due to police brutality or other sorts of dynamics. And I show this image, again, for its irony, the injustice that um, uh, indigenous people uh, relegated to the term natives and their signs put up uh, for others who have now settled in the country uh, to be wary of them. Now, admittedly, these are not the conditions of now and South Africa has moved on from these sorts of bizarre states. But I, I, I just want to caution that the residue of, of these moments are still lives with us in many sorts of ways. And it was quite, uh, quite relevant with the police. So moving very, very quickly, I, I was asked to design a railway police station and the, one of the fundamental challenges that I had was I had to engage with my own personal bias and, and, and uh, about, about the police, uh, remembering that all people deserve dignity, that in fact, if you make a, a functional and appealing uh, police station, 
you will hopefully have a chance to impact on the experience of the police staff. And if that helps make their experience with ordinary people better or alternatively ordinary people feel more welcome to police stations, so be it. So I, I did a number of things which uh, at the time were fairly radical, but might seem fairly ordinary today. You'll notice that there's no fence around the building. I was quite intentional that I didn't want to defense a building. Um, historically, we would have had what are called burglar bars on the windows. I designed the window frame so the burglar bars on the inside, because I didn't want to project a building that seemed fearful or afraid. Um, even the choice of the color white, um, I wanted a building that needed to be maintained and that would show up wear and tear, as opposed to what I was told in the beginning, which is use brickwork because you never have to clean it. So there's also this question of, of the relationship between the tectonics and intimacy. Uh, I think also it plays a big part in terms of um, at least environmental justice and so on. The more we make people care about buildings and care about trees and care about the environment, I think we'll get closer towards points of equity. Conscious that probably I'm running out of time, I'll just quickly take through the plans. They're very basic cruciform diagram, again, with the sort of central spine, uh, which brings the public realm into the building, a sort of uh, horizontal line, which acts as a sort of semi-public zone where the police staff interact, and then hey, it's hey, flanked hey. by a series of squares. Yes, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, and then it's flanked by, by a series of, of um, cellular spaces, uh, which, which define the sort of, uh, uh, you know, the, the cruciform, uh, cruciform arrangement. And then, yeah, just some, some quick renderings here, some shots on that side. And what, what interested me about this, uh, this police station is that a couple of things. One is that it became one of the most sought after places for police staff persons to work at. Uh, crime dropped radically um, in that sort of area. And the, the reporting of crime increased as people felt more welcome to actually come to the police station and make their complaints. So although there might not be exact empirical direct correlations, I do think that architecture does have the ability to make a more just world, uh, you know, both for the people who work inside these buildings, but also for the environments in which these buildings are, are located. Um, and with that, I think I, I will not abuse time any further. I just wanted to let you know that I have done work on a food and allied workers museum, also in a township. And there the idea was about creating uh, a museum that, that gave honor to the, 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 the workers' unions who played a big part in freeing South Africa and so on. And the narrative of how one has created a museum uh, from, from that perspective of acknowledging the, and celebrating uh, the, these particular workers was, was, another, was another point in my work. So all in all, um, you know, I, I mentioned in the beginning this question of visual, this notion of prejudice. All of my projects would not have been possible if I thought that justice was blind. It, it, in fact, I had to see uh, and see more than what was readily apparent. I had to bring bias into the equation. And I also think that the, the architect, as much as, as much as architects was very limited in changing the world, and I sincerely believe that, I do think the ambitions of the architect must always be high, but the, um, the, the, the expectations should always be low because at the end of the day, uh, buildings are buildings and we can't really control the behavior of human beings. We can only guide the behavior of human beings through how we uh, automate and, and delineate space. And I'll stop there.